Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel. We covered some really heavy material in my last two videos, so I thought it would be fun to kind of go back again like we did with the Black Dahlia and do another vintage crime. And luckily enough, our sponsor today fits right in with the theme. Our sponsor today is June's Journey, and June's Journey is a hidden object mystery game for iOS or Android. It's a free download on your phone or tablet. I'm not even lying to you when I tell you I've gotten so addicted to this game in the past week. I don't have a lot of time to sit down and play games, so when I do play games, it's nice to play a game like June's Journey. It's a captivating detective story that takes place in the 1920s in New York City, and it goes all over the world. There's hundreds of beautifully colored and carefully painted scenes. It's relaxing and challenging at the same time. At the end of the day, when I have a few moments after I put Bella to bed and before I put Aiden to bed, Aiden and I love to sit together and play this game because we kind of like chase each other to who can find the objects first. The best part for me is that it's mystery based and murder based. You know, it's about June, a woman whose sister and brother-in-law have been murdered and she's trying to figure out what happened. And you guys know me, I love history, so I love the historical element. I love the 1920s vibe, the flapper clothes. It's a really fun game, so I highly suggest you guys give it a try, give it a look. It's a free download for iOS or Android, so if you want to check out June's Journey, there's a link in my description box. You can click it and download it and start being as addicted as me and Aiden are. Before we dive right into the case, I wanted to show you guys my shirt. If you follow me on Instagram, I'm sure you've already seen it because I've been obsessed with it, but it's a hoodie, like a zip up hoodie. And it says basically a detective on it. And I love it. I love that it has like longer sleeves, but it's slim fit. I love that it has the white zipper accent. I love that it says basically a detective because basically I feel like I am a detective. This zip up I got from an Etsy shop called French Toasty Good. And this is not sponsored, but you guys know that I love to show you all my new true crime gear. So I just thought I'd share with you. If you like it, I'll put the link in the description box. Let's get started. So today we are sticking with the 1920s vibe that June's journey kindly gave us. So this case is a case I was already familiar with because I used it in my final project in 11th grade when I took a death and dying course and my final project was on the death penalty. This case was prevalent because it actually made people start to think that maybe the electric chair wasn't the best form of execution. This is the case of the granite woman and the putty man let me set the scene for you. Manhattan, 1914. A year when a terrorist bomb detonated in an apartment building on Lexington Avenue on July 4th, killing the conspirators who had planned to use the bomb to blow up John D. Rockefeller's home in Terrytown. This is also the year when the roots of the Women's Peace Party marched 1,500 women through the streets of New York City, protesting World War I. This is also the year when 19-year-old telephone switchboard operator Ruth Brown would mistakenly place a call that would change the path of her life and others. She placed a call that was intended for a manufacturer, but instead she reached the office of 32-year-old Albert Schneider. Albert Schneider was the art editor in Motorboating Magazine. He was not happy with the disruption to his workday and he laid into her for calling the wrong number, to which she sweetly replied, please excuse me, sir. Albert was a man who could be whipped into a frenzy quickly, but he was also a man whose temper could fade just as easily. So after some time had passed, he felt bad and guilty for having yelled at a strange woman over the phone and he called her back and apologized. He called her back to apologize and suggested that his poor behavior deserved an in-person apology. That same day, he went to her place of work and once he saw the young, tall blonde with the ice blue eyes, he was instantly intrigued by her. He started visiting her at work more often and eventually he offered her a job as a reader and copyist at the magazine he worked at, Motorboating, and she readily accepted. Albert Schneider was one of six siblings and he was very close to his mother, often helping her around her home because he was really good with his hands. He grew up boating and fishing, he loved nature, and he was constantly tan from all the time he had spent outdoors. 
Ruth Brown was born to Scandinavian immigrants, her father having changed his last name from Sorensen to Brown when he came to the US so he didn't give away his Norwegian roots. When he and his wife started a family, he walked away from his life as a sailor to become a carpenter, but always seemed unhappy with that decision, missing life at sea. Ruth's father was a hard worker and he was good at what he did, but he didn't make a lot of money, so the family was always trying to make ends meet. Ruth was constantly being reminded that there wasn't enough money. There was a doll she wanted, she couldn't have the doll. There was a new dress she wanted, they couldn't afford the dress. She didn't do very well in school, she had no interest in reading and writing, she found it boring. Ruth grew up longing for the finer things in life, a life that would be easier and less stressful, and that life did not include worrying about money. She didn't have any career aspirations besides being a wife to a man who could give her the finer things in life, and when she met Albert Schneider, she thought she had found just the man. He began courting her soon after she started working at motorboating, and he spared no expense in doing so. Expensive fancy dinners, nights on the town, the theater. Albert was an older man of means, but he was lonely. He had been engaged for 10 years to a woman named Jessie Gizzard, but she sadly had died before they could get married, and he had been lonely ever since, and he figured it was time to settle down and take a wife. But Albert would never forget Jesse Gizzard, and it would become a constant point of contention between himself and Ruth. Not at first though. At first Ruth was just all starry-eyed about the older, worldly man who was showering her with attention and gifts and nights out. He was showing her a sample of what life with him might be like. Never worrying about money, frequenting all the best places in Manhattan, living in a nice home with nice things. These are dreams and aspirations that Ruth had had since she was a little girl. And Albert was just grateful for the company to have a pretty blonde on his arm when he went out at night. He had propositioned her many times and she was a little taken back by his proposition. And when I say proposition, I mean he wanted to have sex with her. She was taken back by this and she said, I'm a virgin and I'm saving myself for marriage. So he proposed to her and she happily accepted. One issue that Ruth did have with Albert was his last name, Schneider. Just as her father had changed his last name when he came to the States to appear to be more American, Ruth wanted Albert to change his last name from Schneider to Snyder. She thought Schneider sounded too German, and with you know being in the middle of World War I, sounding too German at that point wasn't the best thing to be. And he did it. He changed his last name from Schneider to Snyder for her. But this marriage was doomed from the start. There was a large age difference, which put them at completely different points in their life. Albert was at the point in his life where he wanted to spend his time fishing and sailing, two of his greatest passions that his wife did not share at all. In Ruth, she was 19. She wanted to go out and drink and dance. And Albert was like, what did I sign up for? I don't want to be out all night. I'm not a teenager anymore. I'm a man in my 30s. And Ruth was like, you're boring. So you can see there was definitely some headbutting going on. Albert was looking for a woman to settle down with that he could discuss big ideas with, books, art, culture. Ruth was not interested in any of that. She found it dull and boring. At this point, the newlyweds still lived in Albert's home in Manhattan, and the entire place was just filled with the ghost of Jessie Gizzard. There was an enormous painting of her that hung in the most prominent space, like in the living room in his home. He had a photo album just dedicated to her in the home, and he always wore a stick pin every single day. No matter what he was wearing, he would put this stick pin in the lapel of his coat, and the stick pin bore the initials JG. This was Jesse Gizzard's stick pin, and he wore it every single day. So I understand how this might have been annoying to Ruth. Ruth would be driven to jealous fits and she would take the painting of Jesse down, but there was always an enormous fight after it, which ended with her having to put it right back up. This is definitely messed up on Albert's part because you're married now, your new wife lives with you, and you still have all these mementos of your old fiance laying around your house and a huge painting of her in your living room. 
In 1917, Ruth became pregnant, which she was very happy about because she thought that's what you do when you get married. You get pregnant, you have babies, and you have a family. But Albert was not happy about it. He had never wanted children. He thought he was too old to be woken up in the middle of the night and to be changing diapers, the crying all day. He was just not having it. He didn't want anything to do with it. And she couldn't understand why he was so upset about having a baby. He was even more upset when the baby was born and it was found out to be a little girl who was named Lorraine. As is typically the story with relationships that are already in trouble, the birth of their daughter drove the couple further apart, not closer together. Albert didn't like the fact that the newborn took all of Ruth's attention and that she wasn't giving him as much attention. He was also of the opinion that being pregnant had ruined Ruth's figure, which he expressed to her often. They moved around New York City a little while before settling in a nice two and a half story house in Queens and every place they moved, picture of Jesse Gizzard would be prominently displayed. And when they settled in their home in Queens, it was no exception. The portrait of Albert's ex-fiance was hanging in the living room. When the family settled in Queens, the situation between Ruth and Albert went from bad to worse. At this point, Ruth's mother had moved in with the family and Ruth was going out nightly. She always wanted to be out and she had a built-in babysitter now with her mother being there, so she felt like she could. One afternoon, Ruth was having lunch with a friend of hers at a Swedish restaurant called Henry's when her friend introduced her to a corset salesman named Judd Gray. Now, Ruth was concerned about her figure since pregnancy, probably because her husband always told her she should be. So she was definitely interested in talking to the average looking corset salesman who wore glasses and seemed completely unassuming and harmless. Judd Gray was a Cortland, New York native, close to both his parents, but especially his mother. He spent his childhood playing sports and regularly attending church, and when he was a toddler, his parents moved to New Jersey. High school wasn't for him. He experienced some health issues when he was younger, including a bad case of pneumonia, and he left school to get better, deciding not to return. Like Ruth, he wasn't interested in getting an education. He was interested in getting a job. So he actually started working with his father in the jewelry business for a little while, but that didn't work out. And eventually he got a job with the Bien Jolie Corset Company. He met a young lady named Isabel when he was 16. He married her when he was 22, and shortly after, they gave birth to their first and only daughter. They lived a simple, white picket, middle-class existence in New Jersey. Isabel was quiet and shy. Judd was a normal guy who liked to do things like go out for drives in his car and play golf. The Gray family were regular churchgoers, and Judd even volunteered at his local church's Sunday school every week. From the outside, it looked like they had the perfect like white picket fence American dream kind of life. But inside, Judd Gray was silently resenting his boring average life and his boring average wife. Later, Judd would write about Isabel. Isabel, I suppose, one would call a homegirl. She had never trained for a career of any kind. She was learning to cook and was a careful and exceptionally exact housekeeper. As I think it over searchingly, I am not sure we were married these many years of her ambitions, hopes, her fears, or her ideals. We made our home, drove our car, played bridge with our friends, danced, raised our child, ostensibly together, married. Never could I seem to attain with her the camaraderie that formed the bond between my mother and myself. And when Judd Gray met Ruth Snyder, he was electrified by her. She was everything his wife was not. She was tall, she was outgoing, she smiled and laughed a lot. She was up for anything. It was always an exciting time when he was with her. She showed him that life could be something to be enjoyed, not just tolerated. Judd Gray for Ruth was an escape from the emotionless, domineering marriage that she suffered through every day. He was infatuated with her. He would compliment her. He would listen to her go on for hours about the old crab, which she had started calling her husband, Albert. It didn't take long before she realized Judd Gray was a full on mama's boy and she asked him to call her mommy or mama which he happily agreed to. They began an affair where they would see each other often. They were such regulars at the Waldorf Astoria that they actually kept an overnight bag in one of the lockers there with the necessities like nightgowns and cards. 
The two would go out drinking and dancing, and some of these nights, when too much gin was consumed, the conversation would turn to dark matters. Later, the two could never agree on who brought up the idea of murdering Ruth's husband first. Judd claims that Ruth would complain to him all the time about her many unsuccessful attempts to kill her husband in what looked like an accident. Albert liked to work on his cars in his garage a lot, so Ruth said one day she had rigged the lift that lifts his car up while he was under it so that it would slip out from underneath the car and the car would fall on him. And Albert rolled out from under the car, missing being crushed by it by inches. Another time she said while he was in the garage, again, she brought him a drink, but in the drink she'd slip something in there to make him sleep. And he woke up with the car running and the garage door closed and he was basically just inhaling carbon monoxide and he woke up just in time to pop open the garage door and get out of there. So according to Judd Gray, Ruth had already tried many times to off her husband. Ruth Snyder had three insurance policies on her husband, one for $1,000, one for $5,000, and one for $45,000. And that third insurance policy, the one for $45,000, it had a double indemnity clause on it, which meant that if Albert Snyder were to die accidentally, then Ruth, his beneficiary, would receive double the amount of the payout. Ruth, on the other hand, said Judd Gray was the first one to bring up killing her husband because that way they could be together. Now, when you look at their stories, who do you believe? I definitely believe that Ruth was the first one to bring it up. I definitely believe, especially considering the insurance policies, that she wanted him gone because she would financially benefit from that. Finally, the talk turned from more than just talk to action, and the couple decided they were really going to do this. They took a romantic trip to Kingston, New York, where they would pick up the items that they'd need to carry this out, including chloroform, picture wire, and a dumbbell weight. Judd Gray also gave Ruth a package one day that included some items that she wanted, like a flesh roller, which was this rolling pin contraption that was supposed to dissolve fat on your body. Like, does that exist? That would be amazing. And this package also contained some envelopes with powders and the powders were supposed to be put in Albert's drink to make him fall asleep the night that they were going to murder him. On the evening of Saturday, March 19th, 1927, Ruth, Albert, and their daughter Lorraine were at a neighbor's house playing bridge for the evening. At around midnight, Judd Gray slipped into the home of the Snyders through a door that Ruth had left unlocked for him. Albert had had a lot to drink that evening, and when they got home around 2 a.m., he went right to bed. Ruth acted as if everything was normal. She put on her nightgown and she got into bed next to him. When she was sure that he was sleeping, she snuck back downstairs to meet with her lover. And apparently they, um, apparently they were intimate that very night downstairs while her husband slept upstairs before they killed him. Afterwards, they conferred quickly, they made a plan, and Ruth took her lover by the hand and led him upstairs to the master bedroom. They were standing by the bed, looking down at Albert while he slept, and Ruth looked at Judd and said, do you think you can do this? And he weakly replied, I think so. He then lifted the weight that they had purchased and he brought it down on the head of Albert Snyder, but he did so very half-heartedly. Judd Gray was a corset salesman. He enjoyed nice afternoon drives. He wore glasses. He was very ordinary, and he wasn't a murderer, I don't think, by nature, so I don't think he had the stomach for it. Albert, of course, woke up because no amount of sleeping powders are going to keep you sleeping through a blow to the head with a weight. So he woke up, realized he was being attacked, and began fighting back for his life. Surprisingly, Judd Gray was no match for a man who was drunk, drugged, and twice his age because he struggled with Albert Snyder and he eventually looked to Ruth and said, mommy, mommy, help me. I swear to God, I can't make this up. Even though Ruth didn't wanna get her hands dirty, that was her whole plan, not getting her hands dirty. That's why she had enlisted somebody else to help her. At this point, she really didn't have a choice. She was witnessing her husband and the man she loved, allegedly, wrestling. And if Judd didn't win and Albert won, they were both going to go to jail forever. She doused Albert in chloroform, but this did not quell his will to live. She then took the picture wire and put it around his neck and tried to choke him with it 
but he still was fighting. Finally, she took the weight that Judd had ineffectively used just moments before and began slamming it down on the head of her husband until he stopped moving. They both stood there by the bed again, looking at the unmoving body of Albert Snyder, and she said to Judd, do you think he's dead? Judd Gray looked at himself, seeing that his hands and clothes were covered in blood, and Ruth had a big bloody handprint on the front of her nightgown from the struggle with her husband. Calmly, Ruth just grabbed some of Albert's clothes for Judd, told him, you know, get changed, put these on, took all the bloody clothes and brought them downstairs to the incinerator to be burned. In the aftermath, they now had to figure out a story of how Albert Snyder had ended up beaten to death in his bed. Ruth grabbed her jewelry and stuffed it under the mattress of the bed, and then Ruth and Judd proceeded to go around the house, like knocking chairs over and ripping cushions off the couch and just like cutting into them, tearing curtains down just to make it look, you know, like somebody had come into the home. As all this is happening, as they're staging the entire house to look as if there was a home invasion, Judd is just pouring himself a drink after drink after drink, throwing them back because he just can't even right now. Before Judd left, he found an Italian newspaper and he was like, this sounds like a perfect plan. We're gonna say that two immigrants came in here and killed your husband and tied you up and took your jewelry and everybody will believe that story. But in order for this to be realistic, Ruth had to appear to be a victim. As the sun began to rise on the morning of March 20th, Judd Gray was tying the hands and feet of his lover to a chair and putting a cheesecloth in her mouth to gag her. The whole plan was that Ruth would wait there tied up until Lorraine woke up naturally and found her. But Ruth, not surprisingly, was an impatient person and she could not wait for Lorraine to wake up naturally. So after just a few moments of being tied up, she actually like somehow managed to scooch her way to Lorraine's door, her bedroom door, and started like banging on it with her foot and you know, trying to call out, Lorraine, Lorraine, help me through the gag. So finally, obviously, this little nine-year-old girl who's sleeping, she has no idea what's going on. She comes out, sees her mother like that, takes the gag out of her mouth. Her mother says, go get some help. Lorraine runs over to the neighbors to get help, and they call the police. Now, Judd Gray, not a seasoned murderer, not a criminal mastermind, but he was smart enough to know he'd probably need an alibi. So he'd taken certain precautions to verify his whereabouts the night that Albert Snyder would die. He'd given his hotel key to his friend, Hayden Gray, who's not related, they just have the same last name, and he told Hayden that he was gonna be with Ruth that night, so he needed a cover. He told Hayden to go in to the hotel room, mess up the sheets as if somebody was sleeping there, call down to the front desk and identify himself as Judd Gray and say that he wasn't feeling well and he didn't wanna be disturbed. He also told Hayden to mail some letters that Judd had written and to place a do not disturb sign on the hotel room door. But when he left the Snyder home that morning, he was in a state of distress and he behaved rather oddly, which caused several people to notice a normally unnoticeable man. While he was waiting at the bus stop, Judd Gray saw a police officer shooting beer bottles and he struck up a conversation with an elderly man also waiting at the bus stop with him. And he said to him, I would hate like hell to stand in front of him and have him shoot me. He then nervously shouted to the police officer, I wouldn't want you shooting me. <laughs> I know it's not funny, but this guy was so stressed out. He was behaving so ridiculously. He was drinking when they were staging the house. He's all sorts of like stressed out about what just happened. And he's yelling at a police officer about how he doesn't want him to shoot him. And he's drawing more attention to himself. Judd Gray was an unremarkable man. He would have gone under the radar unnoticed had he just kept his mouth shut and maybe didn't have so many shots at the house. When he left the bus station, he hailed a cab and asked the cab driver to take him to Manhattan. And when he got out at Manhattan, he tipped the cab driver five cents, which was quite a high tip in the 1920s. And so the cab driver looked a little bit more closely at the normal looking guy sitting in his back seat. Meanwhile, at the Snyder residence, Lorraine has enlisted the help of her neighbors, the Mulhousers, and they run over with Lorraine to the Snyder home. They untie Ruth and then they call the police. The police show up and at first the scene seems to be just as Ruth has described it, a home invasion. 
She told them after they'd gotten home from the party last night, two Italian immigrants attacked her husband and killed him and stole her jewelry. But on further inspection, the police started using their logic and they said, why would two home invaders or assailants come in here to steal jewelry, kill somebody, and then just wreck the house when nothing else was taken? They didn't understand why these Italian men would be okay with killing Albert but leave Ruth alive to identify them. And as they searched the house more thoroughly, they found a couple things in the master bedroom. One, they found all the jewelry that Ruth had stashed under the mattress, which, is she stupid or what? That's a crime scene, like your husband's dead on that bed. They're of course going to check the bed for evidence. Why didn't she move it? Why didn't she hide it in a different place? They found the jewelry, so they knew that the jewelry hadn't been taken. And they also found a stick pin laying on the floor with the initials JG. Now they assumed this stick pin belonged to the assailant or one of the assailants because nobody in the household had the initials JG. And they didn't know about Albert Snyder's ex fiance They didn't know it was something he wore every day. And they didn't ask Ruth about it because after finding the jewelry, they suspected her. One of the police officers, Arthur Carey, he was looking through Ruth Snyder's checkbook and he saw a $200 check made out to a Mr. Judd Gray. And that's when he put two and two together, or he thought he put two and two together, right? Because we know the stick pin's not Judd Gray's, but he's like, oh, Judd Gray, JG. Maybe this pin belongs to Judd Gray because it's got the initials JG on it. So they bring Ruth in for questioning and the first thing they ask her is, who's Judd Gray? And this woman just handles it really poorly and she immediately says, oh, has he confessed? Because she doesn't know they found the stick pin. She doesn't know they went through a checkbook. She thinks they already know at this point what happened, that maybe Judd had thrown her under the bus. So she's gonna throw him back under the bus. When she said that, the police were like, um, no, we were just asking you who he was. We haven't been able to locate him for questioning yet, but Okay. They spoke to the DA and it was decided that both Ruth Snyder and Judd Gray should be arrested and charged in the murder of Albert Snyder. After this, of course, they both turned on each other saying that the idea to kill Albert was the other person's idea first and this started in an incredible media frenzy. As we've already discussed, Judd was a small, bespectacled, you know, ordinary looking man. He didn't give off any murdery vibes. But Ruth was tall and domineering in her personality and she had these icy blue eyes that never seemed to warm up. The press ran with this and they began to print stories in support of Judd Gray, speaking out against the steel-willed woman who had seduced him and tricked him into becoming an accessory to murder. The paper started calling them the Putty Man and the Granite Woman. Nicknames that characterized Judd Gray as a spineless, helpless man who had been manipulated by the woman made of stone. The papers also called her Ruthless Ruth, Vampire, the Viking Ice Matron of Queen's Village, the Blonde Fiend, Marble Woman, and a host of other creative and redundant nicknames. People began comparing her to famous murderesses throughout history, such as Lucrezia Borgia and Lady Macbeth. The press had a field day with this story because it had everything you would want in a news story. It had love, it had infidelity, it had murder, it had insurance fraud. The biggest names in crime reporting covered this story, including James Cain, who would go on to write a novel about this case called Double Indemnity, and that novel would actually also be made into a movie by the same name. According to Judd Gray, Ruth had tricked her husband into signing all three of the insurance policies by telling him they were the same insurance policy in triplicate. I have a hard time believing that Albert Snyder, as a businessman and a smart person, didn't read or look at the papers before signing them, but I'm sure there was some trickery involved. The trial was a public affair, and once again, a media circus. Everybody wanted to get a glimpse of the two people that the newspapers had made into basically comic book characters. The opposing lawyers pointed fingers at the other's client. Ruth's lawyer said she wasn't a party girl, she just wanted to be a good wife and a good mother but she'd been broken down and verbally abused by her husband for so long that she was vulnerable to any attention and affection from any man, and Judd Gray was just that man. Judd's lawyer pointed out his clean criminal record and his impeccable character. He said, sexy Ruth was Eve and the serpent all rolled into one, an irresistible temptress. I can't believe they talked like that in trial. For the most part, everybody who's familiar with the case and the information in the case 
thought that Judd was manipulated and drawn in by Ruth, who sat there the entire trial staring unapologetically at everyone with her icy gaze. But no one could really excuse his involvement though, even if she had coaxed him into it or talked him into it, he still willingly took part in a murder of somebody. So they were both found guilty of first degree murder and they were both sentenced to death. Ruth and Judd were both transported to the death house at Sing Sing, which was the same building that the electric chair was housed. The same electric chair Ruth would soon find herself seated in. At the time she was imprisoned there, she was the only woman occupying the death house at Sing Sing. While the general public had sympathy for Judd Gray, his fellow inmates did not. This is the world of uber masculine prisoners. You know, they think that any sign of male weakness is worse than any crime you could ever commit. So when they had heard that Judd Gray had tried to pin everything on Ruth, they like thought he was the lowest of the low and they shunned him. They wouldn't talk to him. He didn't have any really friends on the inside. Although Ruth was kept very isolated from the other inmates, she was the only woman there, of course, so they had to keep her away from the general population. She was not lonely in jail. She had a lot of fan mail and a lot of correspondence and received 164 marriage proposals. And while she sat alone in a cell, Ruth did a lot of writing. Ruth wrote her own memoirs, which would later be published as my own true story, so help me God. Remember how Ruth could never be bothered with reading or writing? Well, it, it shows in this memoir. There's no focus, no sentence structure, no clear end, no clear beginning. It's just like random observations and crazed kind of frenzied thoughts. I mean, it was bad. It's the crazed thoughts of a woman who at this point doesn't know which way is up. She did spend a great deal of time though warning other women away from infidelity in their relationships. She writes, I wish a lot of women who may be sinning could come here and see what I've done for myself through sinning and maybe they would do some of the thinking I have done for months and they would be satisfied with their homes and would stop wishing for things they should try to get along without when they can't have them. No punctuation in there at all, by the way, no punctuation. Ruth and Judd's executions were scheduled for January 12th, 1928. And in normal fashion for the time, Ruth would go first. They liked to get the most distressing execution out of the way first, whatever they thought would be the most emotionally draining, and obviously Ruth would have been the one. As she was led to the electric chair, her eyes were red and puffy from, I'm sure, days of crying. And they hadn't shaved her entire head, but they had shaved a spot on the back of her head where they would place the electrode. As soon as she saw the electric chair, her body went limp and she just freaked out. They had to drag her to the chair, put her in it, and put the mask on her face. As they did, she began praying out loud for her executioners. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because of the intense media presence that followed this case, the police were very careful with Ruth's execution. There would be no media allowed in, and there certainly wouldn't be any cameras allowed in. The New York Daily News needed to find a way around this since they wanted the scoop on all other papers. And since they knew all the guards at Sing Sing would be familiar with all the press from New York, they enlisted the help of a photographer from Chicago who worked for one of their papers that they owned. This man, Tom Howard, he strapped a custom single-use camera to his ankle, which would be covered by his pant leg and ran the wire to the shutter release up his pant leg so he could reach it with his hand. He walked right into the execution viewing area with no issue. He had to guess based on where his toe was pointing if he even had her in frame, but it ended up actually you know, being a little blurry and not of the greatest quality, but a pretty good picture, all things considered. Just as they flipped the switch to electrocute Ruth Snyder, he clicked the shutter and caught the picture that would become famous. Like I said, it wasn't a great quality photo, but it was a morbid look into the last moments of a woman's life. And the next day, this picture was printed on the front page of the New York Daily Mirror with the simple headline, Dead. This photo was hailed as the most famous tabloid photo of the decade, and paper after paper flew off the newsstand into the hands of people hungry to get a glimpse into the execution of Ruth Snyder. The photo is really dark, but for some reason it's hard to look away, especially after learning a little bit about Ruth, how she grew up, what kind of person she was, her relationship with her husband. It's, it's just, it's morbid and dark, but you, kind of want to look at it. 
Judd Gray's execution was not much of a spectacle at all. He died as he had lived, quietly and without trouble. He allowed them to walk him to the chair calmly, he didn't fuss, and when they had trouble getting the mask on his face, he kind of shifted his head so that it would make it easier for them. And as he sat there in the chair, he said, Blessed are the pure in spirit, for they will be comforted. And then he was gone. I think there's a way we can relate to every person that's involved in this tangled mess. We can relate to Albert, who was, you know, kind of a cranky guy, but maybe had a good heart. He felt compelled to call a telephone operator to apologize for being rude. He didn't know her. He didn't know anything about her, but he still felt compelled to apologize for his rude behavior, so maybe he had a good heart underneath it all. Ruth Snyder, a woman who was born into a family who had to struggle their whole life financially and just wanted to live where she didn't have to worry about money. A young woman who married an older man and then realized that he wanted her to kind of just do what he wanted instead of what she wanted. She was still young. She wanted to live her life. She wanted to party and have fun, and he didn't want her to do that. Additionally, she had to live with the ghost of her ex-husband's dead fiance in her home all the time, always knowing that she would take second place in his heart, no matter what. And that has to be mentally taxing on somebody, I think. That has to cause a lot of resentment, right? And then you have Judd, a man who finds himself in a life that he didn't even know he didn't want before he was deep in it. And then he meets an exciting woman and he feels alive for the first time in a long time. So he does something crazy and stupid, but he did it because he was just feeling lost in life. He was just feeling like he wanted excitement and he sure got it. Or maybe you don't sympathize at all with any of these deeply flawed, troubled individuals who made their own choices that led to their demise who did things selfishly and impulsively, not considering how it would affect other people. The people in this situation I feel the worst for are Lorraine Snyder and Jane Grey. Lorraine Snyder was obviously Albert and Ruth's daughter and Jane Grey was Isabel and Judd Grey's daughter. These were the daughters of selfish people who didn't really put their kids first. I could never find out what happened to little Jane Grey, but after her parents' deaths, Lorraine went to live with Ruth's mother and they actually fought the Prudential Insurance Company for the money owed to her after her father's death. I couldn't find an obituary for Lorraine Snyder online and if she did grow up and get married, I'm sure she changed her name and if she didn't get married, I'm sure she changed her name anyways to get away from the memory of what, what I'm sure was the most traumatic thing that's ever happened to her. There are some online rumors saying that Lorraine Snyder killed herself when she was a teenager because she couldn't live any longer with the last selfish thing that her mother had given her. The stigma of being the daughter of the granite woman. Okay, that's it today. I hope you guys enjoyed this little vintage case. It's not going up on a Monday, so it's not a mystery Monday. It's just a bonus video for you guys this week, and I hope you loved it and enjoyed it, and let me know in the comments what you think. And also, don't make fun of my nails because I had acrylics on for a party that we went to last weekend, but I don't like having acrylics on. I don't like having nails because it's way too much maintenance and ain't nobody got time for that. So now I'm just letting them kind of come off. I'm actually trying to pry them off. So they're coming off one by one, but for a little while I'm gonna look kind of janky. So just bear with me, don't judge me. I have to go out in public like this today. People are definitely gonna judge me. Stay kind and stay beautiful, everybody. I love you so much and I will see you soon. Have a great day. Bye. I'm <laughs> so bad. She's like a sickness in my brain A vision standing by the window pane She ripples through the blinds And leaves me in a daze It's in the way her body moves me